Okay, so let's get started. Well, let's get back again to the, and tell people who we are. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> idea. Who are we? Yeah, you start. I can start. Hi everyone, I'm Ole Lensmar, uh, CTO here at uh, smartparents.com. Yes, and yes. chief architect for SmartPair. Yes, well, to be, to be, yeah. thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, to be is chief architect of SmartPair yeah. software, yes. Yeah. And I'm Nicholas uh, of, of SmartPair. Uh, yeah, I'm Dane. Um, currently on the Load UI team, working with Load UI. Load UI is your baby. It is. Yep. Uh, yeah. Been ah. working on it from the start, uh, yep. and it's really nice to see it coming, you know, to release finally yep. as yeah. uh, a more mature product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've done a great job. Yep, all of you guys. So, and now I'm Henrik, also from the Load UI team. A bit of a newer member. Yeah. But I've been there for a while now. Yep. Yeah. You're known as Mr. Minimalist. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yes. So, uh, okay, so the plan is we'll start with, I, I'm going to show you uh, two new features, three new features actually in, uh, in SOAP UI 4.5. Uh, we, we got a lot of questions in advance. Uh, and a, a big bunch of them was how do you start a project and so on. So I, I'll actually start from the very beginning, just for you guys. Uh, and then you two will do Logi demo. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have time for question and answers. That's where mm -hmm. you yeah, that's are. Why I'll, <laughs> I'll be answering questions yeah. to my. Oh, it looks like I, I think I, I screwed up here. Uh, uh, I, I switched to the screen mode while we were presenting ourselves. So yeah. someone's asking us to do it again. So yep. let's do it really quick. I'm Ole. Nicholas. Dane. Henrik. Okay. okay. So uh, let's get going. Some people are losing the sound here. Um, no stream, no sound. Uh oh, bugger. Can we get that confirmed? Okay. Yeah, on the camera. Do we have uh, anyone on the outside watching? Downstream, okay. Sound okay. okay, well then it's I think it seems local. to be... I think that one of the things we're doing is that this stream actually is pretty... <coughs> it's a heavy duty stream. I think we're uh, pushing uh, 700k out. So okay. it's, it's... So it might lag after some of you, but yep. I mean the recording will be put up then. Yeah. Sorry for any. Uh, yeah, and the problem is there. since we have to record I in good quality to be able to put it on good quality on on, on YouTube, mm. the stream gets kind of fat. Okay. Now. So what I will do here is create a very simple test. I will configure that test to run against multiple environments. I will show how easy it is to switch environments, and finally, I will run it against uh, the SmartPair cloud in the SmartBear Cloud in the new test on demand feature. But first I'll start by creating a project. I will point to Wistel that contains all the information about the web service I need. And I will start creating the test. I will start by using by logging in. Like that, I need to provide some cr credentials in the uh, test. I'll run it, and now I have an active session. To this uh, uh, test, I will add a logout step. like that and in order to log out I need to provide the session ID and this is how I get the session ID. I just point to the response in the login test step and now I create an XPath assertion uh, pointing to that uh, uh, to the session ID in the login response. And I run it and now I'm logged out. So this is uh, my first very crude uh, test case. I, I will add uh, one or two more uh, requests as well. I will add search
and search also needs uh, the session ID so add it here and then the search string which I will use to set to all I will run the uh, test and we can look at the search and here is the response I got back uh, there's a lot of products in the store a protocol droid, a box of chocolates, a towel uh, Ono Sendai 7 cyber system and so on and I will buy one of these so I will add a buy like that Same thing here, we need a session ID, which I added like this, and something to buy. And I will just point to one of the items I got back in the search for all. As such, and we should run the test again. And it's still successful. And I bought uh, the uh, the droid that was will be shipped to me 2,000 years from now. So basically, here we have a, a very simple and hard coded uh, test. Uh, in order to uh, use it in multiple environments, we can't of course use a hard code because there might be difference differences between environment and environment. So what I will do is I will add uh, on project level I will add some custom properties I will add a user I will add a pass in which I will store the uh, login credentials like that and that's uh, basically something I can use now uh, if I want to so I, I will change the, the login to actually get those values so I will point here and I will say I want to use whatever in that uh, user property same thing here I will get the password like that and let's run it and it still works so basically what I've done now is I started to industrialize a bit also uh, I don't like hard coding the search string so uh, I, I, now I want another uh, property in the project itself but this is another way to do it so I'll go here I'll get data and I'll create a new one and let's call it search string and I'll go here and I change the search string to all now we've added it there I can run my case again and still works. So what we have now is is a pretty decent environment, uh, a te pretty decent test to run against the local environment. But if I want to um, to have multiple environments, I I have to set these up. So I'll go into the environments tab on the project level. I will add my first environment which is a local environment uh, that I, I don't have to particularly do something about because it, all the information needed already comes from the um, from the whistle so I'll add it like this maybe I would like to change this but I, I the the path to the endpoint but I don't need to do that what I could do is it took the custom properties uh, from the uh, 
from my from my uh, project, but I could change those if I wanted to, like that. They're still the same here uh, globally, but for my local environment, I've changed it. So I can now go in here, say I want to run this against the local environment, run it, and let's look at the. Uh, That I, uh, I I now I'm using the my special uh, configured uh, uh, inherited global properties. Well, that I, that I've changed, and maybe now I would like to uh, point to ha have another uh, environment, and we'll set up. Uh, global environment I don't need to change this but maybe well I do need to change this so because this is it's not going to run against the this is actually going to run against the cloud so here I have my global environment maybe I should change the uh, global uh, configuration for username and password like that and now I can switch uh, my test case to run against local like that or, uh, or towards the global environment like that oh I did get an error and that's probably because I misconfigured like that let's rerun and have a look at the login and now I'm using uh, username user and password user 123 So this is actually how easy it is to set up uh, your own uh, local environment. I could possibly have added a, a staging environment uh, and now also a live environment because so this is what the global environment is. Now if I want to run, this has all been tested from within the network, right? This has just been uh, from within the network and I know I have access to uh, to to um, to the service from inside the network I know that response times are decent and so on but does it work from the net and this is where test on demand comes in so what I know now is that my tests work from within the network I know that my service is accessible from within the network and that the response times are pretty decent but do I know that it works from um, outside the network for example what happens if I run the test uh, in uh, in London well let's check out so I will select and th these tests are no I can run these tests from uh, two locations in the smartware cloud and I'll choose the London one I just click here so we upload the test case and runs it from the cloud. As you can see it passed and we can watch the test results and see how long each test step took from without from the cloud. And as you can see the response time for the initial step was quite high and this is that's because uh, Amazon takes a bit of time before responding to the first request. I will double check to see if it, if it works the same if I run from Chicago. Yes, and it does. 
And I think this is a fantastic uh, feature uh, we're offering. And, and Test on Demand is part of the open source and free version of SOAP UI. Uh, and I would say this is uh, SmartBear's uh, way of giving love to the community. And I'm really, really proud of this one. I think it's a fantastic feature. And that's it for me. Cool. So uh, should you set up the connection to yeah, the so other computer? Yeah, I'm going to try to do that. <coughs> you have to entertain the audience while I, while yep. I try to do that. And I, I, was, I saw quickly that we had a few uh, questions coming in. Uh, uh, we'll keep tabs on them. I'll start writing them down so we can go back to them uh, and, and try to answer them after the load UI demo. Oh, so it, th this sounds worrisome. So either it's me, WS Beer, or there's something else. Uh, is the uh, the stuff on the screen? There's something that's not making sense. Is, is what they're saying. Okay. Yep. I think we're all, we're all set here. If you wanna. Cool. Uh, switch over to the Load UI guys. The Load UI demo. Hey Henrik, have I uh, told you about my new project that I'm working on? Um, no, I don't think so. Oh, well, it's this new search engine, and it's it's a real Google killer. It's going to be wow. the next big thing. You think so? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, so far, I've got a prototype running, so I thought maybe we'd look at that uh, and try to create a performance test to see how, oh, yeah. how well it performs. So let's create a new project for that. Uh, first step is I'm going to create a scenario where we can kind of set up a, a little uh, scenario for the way I think the users are going to interact with the service. Yep. Um, so I have a SOAP UI project that, that tests the basic functionality. Uh, so I, I figured we'd use the SOAP UI runner to create a load test for that. Oh, ah, yeah, to leverage from your, from your existing functional tests. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is different from, from the old version, right? We've got some new functionality here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I've been working a lot on this, uh, adding a, a view that you can see all the test steps from the SOPI test case. So if you find your projects here. Mm -hmm. Just add it. Yeah, th there we go. You see the three test steps in this login test case. So it seems that it's a data source called fetch user, then a SOAP request, and a proxy transfer. Yeah, yeah, that's what I have in SOAP UI. So you're going for data-driven testing here? Yeah, yeah, I've got a, an Excel file with a bunch of usernames and passwords. Uh, so it's going to be pulling those uh, when this is running and then testing it out. With hey, 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 usernames and passwords for, for a search engine? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the big difference here with Google and, and, and my search engine is that uh, you need to have an account to search. So, so you're going to have to log in uh, and then you can your searches and of course you have to log out at the end mm -hmm. so this this basically represents the, the first login step so we can name it that so we can tell uh, and let's see once my users log in they're gonna obviously start searching but first I'm gonna add uh, a delay step because you know it takes the you know think time or it takes a few yeah. seconds yeah. To, to enter text um, let's do uh, a second, but add some randomness. So, uh, some less, some more. Yeah, around a second, uh, roughly. Sure. Um, but then I'm going to have a splitter here. So, uh, some of my users are going to take one path, and some are going to take uh, another path. Okay, so they log in, they think, then two different paths. Right. And I'm going to uh, weigh these a bit differently. So, I think around 60 here. So I've got 40% going left, 60% going right. Yep. Uh, and now I'm going to add some more SOAP UI runners for the other steps. Uh, this one's the bulk of uh, the whole you know, operations. Uh, here we're going to add the uh, the actual search 
this is what's going to bring you the money. Right. This is yeah. So search. Uh, that's the search request, and that of course requires you to be logged in. So you did see that we have the same session set. Yeah. Notice that. Yeah. That that's uh, copies the 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 session information from the login request, mm. uh, and then stores it with with the actual context. So it goes. Uh, it goes with the user through the delay and spitter, and then once uh, it gets to the runner here, uh, and it yeah. does the search, it's going to have those credentials with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get it. So, so that's that's also one one of the new features in the in the new Sophia runner. Mm -hmm. uh, and after searching, uh, I'm going to actually pull that back up to the delay here. Okay. So once logged in, you can you're allowed to search for any number of times. Yeah, so uh, after searching, you go back to waiting, uh, and then mm -hmm. splitter, so you, you might go up the right, or you'll go to the left again and, and do more searches. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the right path here uh, is going to be the logout step. So whenever you're, you're done with everything, you go out here and you log out. And we name that as well. So this is a pretty uh, simple setup. We're going to have users logging in, and they're going to wait for a while, and they're going to perform a number of searches, waiting in between, and then after a while they're going to log out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's let's test this out and make sure it works. So I'm going to start the test. And here we're getting a warning here because because uh, I don't have anything that's actually generating load, so nothing is going to really happen here. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay because I want to I want to trigger this manually, so I do that by clicking here. Okay, we see that that ran. Uh, we can see here that uh, we had uh, some delays. Uh, okay, and our user looks like he performed two searches and then he logged out. Okay. Uh, so now. Uh, Let's add uh, the actual load here. So by load, you mean what? Uh, a virtual user generator. Yeah. Uh, so this is going to generate the users in the system. And there's a bunch of different ones to choose from. But uh, I'm going to use the fixed rate because it's uh, it's the easiest one uh, to kind of grasp. And it's very, uh, very uh, simple to understand. Uh, so I'm going to set this to uh, two requests per second. Or users actually, so so two users are going to enter the the system uh, each second, and of course they're entering to the login step. Uh, and since we're already running, you can already see that it's happening here. So here our users are coming in; they're running through here, uh, logging in. Here you can see a bunch of them are are waiting in line, uh, or not in line, but they're waiting. Uh, then a bunch of searches are going through, and a bunch of logouts. Uh, so the, the test setup seems to work, right? Yeah. Um, and just to kind of demonstrate uh, that uh, the session is required here, what we can look at uh, disabling the se save session step. So that's gonna it's still gonna log in, but it's not gonna transfer that session that we need later. Uh, so I'll, I'll check that now. This step is disabled, and it's kind of it's skipping over that. It still completes though after so. Mm -hmm. So the test case completes uh, without failures. Right, because there's nothing actually verifying that the session gets saved. That's first needed in the subsequent requests. So here we can see that we're getting a bunch of failures. Yeah, you're right. So people are trying to search, but they're not logged in, so that's failing. And here we're getting failures as well, mm. because you can't log out if you're not logged in. Makes sense. Uh, but let's enable that again. Uh, OK, let's uh, look at some statistics here. So I'm going to switch over to the statistics workbench. Uh, here we would see all our uh, previously saved executions, uh, but since this is a new project, it's empty for now. But we do have the current run here, so I'm going to open that up. Uh, and here we can see uh, in the toolbar on the left here, we see uh, all the different components. What I'm really interested in, though, is the search step, because I mean, logging in and logging out isn't as interesting as the actual search. Yep. So we're just going to look at that. You, do you expect that to be the bottleneck as well? Uh, I mean, that's where all the logic goes, so probably. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I've created a chart with that. Uh, by default, it's added uh, two statistics here. That's uh, 
the time taken, which is the response time, uh, and it's also added the um, throughput uh, TPS, which is transactions per second. Okay, so you're saying uh, time taken, that's how long it takes to, to get from that you click search to get, uh, or I mean, you, you do the search and you get the result. Right. Exactly. And, and TPS is how many? How many searches we're doing per second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to change the scale here because it's a bit uh, hard to see the yellow line. So I'm going to scale down the red one just a bit. That's better. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you can see that we're doing between 0 and 5 uh, searches per second. Uh, and it's varying a bit because of the, the random uh, Twitter and wait times. Yeah. Uh, so could you expand Shard as well? Yeah, sure. We can make that a little bigger so you can see. And there's a bunch of other statistics that we could add here, but for now, let's just focus on these two. Uh, all right. Um, so uh, if we look at the response time here, we see that okay, I've scaled this down a bit. So this is 15, but that's actually 150 milliseconds. Yeah. Uh, most of my response times are pretty close to that. Uh, and they have been throughout the whole test, as you can see. Um, and I've actually done some some uh, testing with the interface and some users, and uh, kind of put in these fake delays. And I noticed that around 170 milliseconds, that seems to be like the sweet spot. As soon as the delay goes above that, uh -huh. then our, my users are saying that it, it feels kind of sluggish, kind of slow. Wow, you've really been working on this. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been putting a lot of effort into this. Uh, so uh, I mean, it looks like they're below. Uh, 170, but uh, just to make sure, you know, we want to be able to, to, to verify that that's always the case. So uh, let's add uh, an assertion for that. So sw switching back to the main window, uh, and this is also new in Mode UI 2.0 uh, is the assertion panel. Uh, here again, we can see uh, my three SOAP UI runners here. Uh, again, we'll look at the search. Uh, we'll call this a, uh, a response SLA. That's just the naming. Um, and we'll look at the time taken variable, uh, look at the uh, actual value for each request here, uh, and set it to be between 0 and 170 milliseconds. OK, so this is uh, you're about to create an assertion which will uh, fail if we will trigger, trigger a failure if the response time is more than 170 milliseconds. Yeah, exactly. And we also have an option here of adding a tolerance. So we could say that it could happen uh, you know, a certain number of times per minute. And that's uh, fine. Like, oh, if it happens once a minute, that's OK. Some flexibility. Yeah, some flexibility. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty pretty big on, on quality, so I'm, I'm going to say no tolerance here. Oh, you're going straight. Yep. Uh, so here it is. It's been created. Uh, and let's uh, start the test again. Okay, so it says zero failures down there in the right corner. Yep. That's good. Yeah. So it looks like it's handling the current load. Failures remain zero and zero. Oh, there's one failure. Um, OK. I, mean, I guess that's not too bad. I mean, it's been running for uh, a few seconds and I only had one failure, so one you, one search was slow. Uh, but let's see what happens if we scale up the uh, the rate at which my users uh, are entering the system. So let's go from two users per second to six users. Okay, so far it's handling. Oh, there's another failure. Okay, now it's starting to climb. Yeah. Yeah. So it takes a while because there's some delays, but as soon as those people start getting along in the search and searching. OK, now we see that it's failing a lot more often Ooh. now we're to 8, 9. You have uh, some tweaking to do on the server side. Yeah, uh, it, it looks like it. I'll have to talk to my engineers about that. Um, so we're seeing, OK, it's failing a lot. Uh, but let's look at uh, the details on this. So let's go back to the statistics workbench. Uh, also new is the event log here, where we can see all the, the data from our uh, search and failures. So here you can see the source here. They're all from the one assertion that we've added. And if we look at one, we see it says, OK, time taken, 181 did not meet the constraints. 
which was 0 to 170. Uh, so here you get the, the actual data. You can see each request uh, that failed, and you can see the exact time that mm. it happened as well. It's a very detailed view. Yeah. Do you, you don't really get the, the big picture, do you? No, you don't. I mean, it's kind of hard to just look at, at rows of data like this. Uh, so that's why uh, we've also added assertions to the charts. So you can see the assertion that we created, the response SLA here, shows up as this yellow bell icon on the toolbar. Uh, and I can drag that to uh, a new chart or to our existing chart. Uh, we'll do the existing one. And then it gets added here. So you see all these green vertical lines? Yep. Those are assertion failures. Uh, and if we scroll back here to the beginning of the test... That was uh, much better. Yeah, you see here we had the single failure uh, pretty early on, yeah. and then almost nothing, and then around here between 35 and 40 seconds. That's uh, when you increase the load. Yeah, increase the load. You can kind of see, you can tell by the uh, the lines here as well, they start getting more erratic and going up a bit. And that's when we started failing uh, quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's really uh, powerful. Uh, but let's let's stop this test and uh, let's look at uh, the the first test we ran. So um, if I close this, we can see uh, the two uh, times I run this test now. Oh yeah, uh, it gets automatically saved there. Yeah, and I can go back to the first one. I didn't have the uh, assertion added here, so obviously you can't you can't see that um, there aren't any failures because the, the assertion didn't exist. Um, but we can we can also compare this to our later run. Uh, so this one ran for a bit longer, but if we go back here to our code, ah, yeah. now we can see that it's actually overlaying uh, the old data with the new data. So uh, the bright the bright lines here are the the old run, kind of the baseline. Did you change the scale? I'm having yeah. a hard time. Yeah, you're right. That's a bit hard to read. Uh, Oh, the yellow one is just going on. There we go. Yeah. Better. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and what what time did I start increasing? Uh, the 30, load? Like 35 something? Yeah. So, um, actually, the, oh, this is looks a bit strange because I didn't have the load generator from the start. Ah, so yeah. We, I just had we weren't the... generating any load. Um, right. You just hit uh, run once. Yeah. But as soon as I did start generating load, oh, unfortunately that was later than uh, the change there. But you can see that the baseline kind of looks a lot smoother, not yeah. as erratic as uh, the change, the one where we increase the, the rate. So uh, at some users uh, were getting the same experience, the same response time from the searches, but, but most users wasn't. And, and the, the difference between users were much larger when you, when you had in your second run. When mm -hmm. you, Exactly. The load, yeah. yeah. So that's, of course, something that I need to look at on the server side to see how I yeah. can uh, you know, make that uh, work a bit better. But, um, but I mean, this is, yeah, sure, sure, this is early and everything, but six users, uh, I mean, entering the system uh, per second, uh, I, I think you're going to need more than that, much more than that to, to uh, take a shot at Google. I think so too, and uh, I mean, first of all, I'm going to fix the, uh, the the application on the server so it performs a lot better. But I'm also going to scale this up. I mean, I'm going to have right now it's running on uh, just an old computer that I found in my basement. But I'm going to have a, a huge server park with you know load balancers and mm -hmm. all these uh, redundancy things and multiple databases and things. So it's gonna it's gonna really perform well once I'm done. Okay, so will your testing scale as well? Uh, well, um, obviously we can probably crank this up a bit uh, without any problems, but uh, after a while it's going to be really hard to uh, kind of reach the limit of my server park with a single machine. So that's when we're going to have to scale up to uh, running this test uh, from multiple machines at the same time. Uh, and in Load UI, uh, we do that using agents. So let's uh, look at the agent tab here. Uh, you can see here there's a toggle that says local, and here it says distributed. So right now we've been running in local mode, and everything's been executing from this computer. But we can switch over to distributed mode, and then we're going to have to add some agent machines. Now, we've installed the Lodua agent software on two machines here on the network, so let's yeah. add those. 
uh, since they're on the local network, they've been automatically detected, so we don't have to enter their IP addresses manually. Uh, there they are. Now they're connected as well. Uh, and if we look back at our test here, you remember we started by creating a, uh, a scenario to put these in. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And if I zoom back out to that level, we can see the scenario here. And here are all the components that we put inside. So they're kind of packaged inside the scenario. Oh, yeah. I get it. Uh, now a scenario in MoUI can be distributed to run on other machines, so that's very handy. Uh, and this little uh, blue guy down here, that's our representation of this scenario. Uh, so I'm just going to drag this to our two agent machines. And that's it? That's it. Now uh, this whole test has been sent out to those machines, and it's, it's uh, been created and it's running. Uh, so once I start this, uh, those sh all the loads should be coming from those machines instead of this one. So, and we can do that now. So then you will get double the load, double six yeah, per second. Yeah, that's a bit much. So maybe we should uh, start by pulling this back down from two. And that should give us well, double, which is four. OK. So now, now we're running the test again. And even though we're running in distributed mode, you can still kind of see these you see, see these numbers moving. Uh, it's getting all this real-time data back from the agents while we're running. Yeah, I can even tell the login runner is doing increasing by four by second. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it's four by second, yeah. Uh, and let's go over to the statistics workbench. Uh, here we're looking at the old comparison, but let's go and look at the new run instead here. Oh, so you have a few, just a few assertions. Yeah, it's still kind of failing. And these lines are a bit behind, but that's because we're running on the agent, so it takes a little bit for me to actually gather up all that data and aggregate it. Yeah. Um, and what we can do here is, uh, well, while we're seeing, obviously, the aggregated data from both the agent machines here, we're seeing uh, the average response time uh, total, and we're seeing the throughput total. Uh, we can expand this on the agents to see for each agent, how it's doing. So you can see that uh, while they're similar, these two charts, they're not showing the exact same data. Uh, yeah. So uh, and that's because it's running obviously on two different machines, and our users aren't getting the exact same response times, but they're similar. I did, that's really cool, actually. And you can uh, you can get a raw data from this. Yeah, you can export this data uh, to. Uh, the raw data to a file, and you can do whatever you want with that. And it's also automatically saved and stored. So even though this is running on the agents, that data is collected on my local machine here. Uh, so later on, when I, I want to look at a different run, I can compare that to something on the agents, or I can compare it to something that I ran locally. Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's all saved uh, automatically. So uh, if I stop this test and switch back, to this overview, you see all, all the three runs here, even though this one was, uh, this latest one was run distri distributed. It looks, yeah. it works just the same, it can be compared just the same. Wow, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, that's how easy it was to create this test uh, to get some results. Now I know that I need to uh, increase the performance of the server. Um, if I had LoDuI Pro, we could uh, do add some server monitors, and I can kind of pinpoint the uh, the problem on the server, like if it's the database or if it's... Oh yeah, so memory. then you get like a uh, database cache hits per second mm -hmm. and you can see it uh, like maybe the RAM is too low or CPU usage spikes when you like adjust the load. So you can see those charts side by side or even in the exactly. same chart. It fits in uh, exactly the same in the same chart so that would really show me where, where the problem is. Uh, but for now at least I know there is a problem. So uh, that's a good start. That's a good start. Uh, and that's going to be it for this uh, demo. Thanks, Ray. Bye. Great. Awesome demo, guys. Thanks. Yeah, fantastic. So um, now it's time for uh, Q&A. Uh, I think that we, what do you guys think? Should we start with the actual, because I think the people that use Twitter should be prioritized and I think I saw one or two uh, uh, questions on Twitter so let's look at them 
Um, if I can find them, there was a lot of tweeting going on. Uh, somebody asked who we have. Oh, was it kind of a Dave VA is asking how many pro license holders for SOPI, if you may ask. May ask. Of course you may. Uh, it's tens, many tens of thousands, is what I can say. Uh, and that's not so strange, because we're uh, really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been around for quite a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so there is... Uh, the, you would, uh, there was some talk about uh, ITCO before. Uh, if if the ITCO ha has a handful of very uh, well-paying customers, we have the opposite. Tons of, of uh, customers that don't pay all that much. We go for more, the more the merrier. Yes. And yeah, also... In the spirit of love, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and also, let's see, I, I had one more question here. Mm, yeah, Ramesh, no, that was answered. If I missed something, please let us know. Uh, Twitter questions come first, just because it's, we're hip with modern now. Um, Bill R, wait, okay, uh, you, you, you go start uh, asking uh, mm -hmm. questions. I, I can answer them. Yeah, answer questions. Yeah, sure. and, uh, I'll, so, I'll go Bill, you're asking about... Uh, yeah, that was uh, what I was oh, you want to do that never one? Never mind, never mind. You do it, sure. Yeah. You do that one. Yeah. And I can... Uh, do we have the, the Excel sheet with all the questions? So how much product testing do we do at Mac OS X? Let's answer that one first. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot. Let's admit it. Yeah, we haven't. I mean, that's why we have a lot of troubles with the Mac issues, right? Yep. And I think but we did actually get kind of fed up with ourselves. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> and our ignorance. So we, we do have one full-time developer now working yeah. solely on Mac. And yeah. I think that shows in the 4.5 release where we have actually addressed uh, a lot of the uh, Issues. annoyances with yeah. Mac. I think we've also introduced some <laughs> 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 that we have now removed in the nightly build. But yeah. uh, it's definitely something that we will be uh, working on more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, but tr traditionally, let's face it, I mean, uh, <coughs> We're using PCs. Uh, most uh, most people, uh, w most our users are using PCs. Uh, so traditionally, we focus on that. We have uh, Linux uh, people here, uh, so there's been a bit of that. Uh, but Mac hasn't been very prioritized. But that said. Uh, w we, we told ourselves at the end of 4.5 that we have to shape up. Mm -hmm. So the end of 4.5 was uh, actually the be we called beta 2 of 4.5 the We Suck Less on Mac release. And we will continue to uh, support the Mac, especially f since one of the developers is, is, is in Mac OS X full time. So he will feel the pain if, 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 if we sucks. don't. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's on the SOPI team, so I mean, that's even more. Yep. Difficult. So we have some other questions here. Yeah, there was uh, one question. That let, let's take that one straight away. It was, let's see who asked it. Sunita. Uh, she asked uh, bo uh, if we can show. I don't think we can show, but let's uh, at least tell her about data driven testing in Load UI. Yeah, you guys want to answer that? Yeah, so what exactly was the question? Uh, how do you do data-driven testing uh, in Load UI? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, basically, I mean, uh, using the SOAP, uh, SOAP UI runner, that's where uh, we have the, the capabilities for data-driven testing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that does kind of require SOAP UI Pro because uh, data sources in SOAP UI uh, are a pro feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Obviously, anything that SOAP UI Pro does, uh, Load UI does as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can create your data sources there uh, that can use you know, Excel files or databases or flat files or mm -hmm. anything, and mm -hmm. uh, that you know pull your data there, like usernames or passwords or whatever you want, mm -hmm. and that works in Load UI as well. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So those are the same data sources you get: Excel, you get JDBC, mm -hmm. you get Grid. Uh, <coughs> text files, directories, 
whatnot. So I mean, basically, uh, more or less all the functional testing features you have in SOAP UI. <laughs> you Alex can, you complained. Can run, you, you were can, projecting to the. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you can run uh, um, uh, as uh, in a load UI as a load test. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So and okay. that's that's always been our goal to to kind of to be able to leverage that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you wanna, as you've seen in in this in this scenario. Uh, what we showed in the demo, you can you can have the data source in one runner, and then you can get out sessions, uh, passwords, or whatever to other runners, to to text files, to anything. So it's not locked in in, in a single component. Uh, yeah, Mox. Uh, let, let's ask because this is uh, a, 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 a one yeah. that we have to say we don't support. Uh, yeah. Vinod, who's yeah. asking, hi, we are trying to use SOAPUI to record a web page with an intent to use it in LoadUI. Mm -hmm. However, the feature does not seem to work even if it apparently records some playbacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we can be honest here, right? Yep. The web recording in SOAPUI is crappy, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I think it's... Uh, I think it's something we definitely have to fix. Yeah, but I think we will never make it good. No, now super never, good. No, but I mean, uh, I think if you want to do like load testing, uh, functional testing, of web applications, complex yep. web applications, you should go for smart web products like Test Complete and Load Complete, which yes. are yes. which really excel in those areas. So uh, I hope. I mean, I'm sorry for the <laughs> if if this has been a disappointment, but I think we're pretty aware that it's not that great. But I think since we have so great other products in the smart web portfolio. Yeah, where the effort is, is more. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, and our goal is to be the best test tool out for uh, APIs. For APIs, yeah. and that's what we'll focus on. And we'll leave. Uh, I mean, uh, test complete uh, is so good for any GUI-based testing. So there's no need for us to work on it. Mm. We'll have it for sanity reasons mm. because you ha have to do sanity tests uh, related to the API test. But that's where we'll. we'll yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. So that where that ties in is you might have like uh, uh, a web service API, a JSON, REST, whatever, where you update some kind of data resources and then you have a web page where you want to validate that oh. that data is exposed correctly. So you, that's why we have the possibility to pull down web pages and validate them. But yep. that's really, really very limited test case and it, <coughs> it doesn't yeah. really, uh, it's, it's far from the possibilities that you have in, in, in the other tools. Yeah. Sid also asked about, uh, I think you asked about it, mock services in SOAP UI. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, when I was doing my, my thing, <coughs> what you were seeing me doing locally uh, was a mock service. And cre I, I would say uh, we don't support REST mock services, although we dream about it. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the uh, the web the SOAP web service mocking is fantastic. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's where you have all the possibility to really yep. build dynamic uh, simulations of yep. your web service. And as you say, the the REST mocking possibilities are very limited. You can basic serve up, basically serve up static files. Yep. Uh, uh, and you can, of course, if you're fond of Google scripting, you can do anything you want. But it's definitely not as easy as it is for SOAP. Yeah. Uh, and that was, the, like you said, said, that was the sample project and the sample project uh, <coughs> mock service. Did you have any load UI? Yeah, there was Wouldn't. one quick one that I can answer, and that's yeah. that you need to have SOAP UI Pro installed on the PC in order to run data-driven tests with load UI. And you do not. Uh, you you probably need it on some machine to create the test, yeah. but once you have the test, uh, you don't need to have SOAP UI installed on the machine, uh, just load UI to actually run it in load UI. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so headless SOAP UI or Pro is the, the actual Sophia Pro engine yeah. is is bundled with with Logia. It's integrated. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of questions on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, they are. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, that was. Uh, you should show your. Yeah, that face. was. Uh, yeah, come on. Come don't on. Be shy. That's Dennis. Come on, Dennis. <laughs> don't be shy. Oh, Thanks sorry. Shy. Okay. Uh, so we'll answer the questions on Twitter. Uh, how do you set up the agents I to run in the cloud? I think that's, that's pro probably not something you can show straight away. Or uh, for load UI agents? Or? Yeah, I guess it's the load UI agents. 
Do but we, we can explain it. Yeah, I mean, the, the Load UI agent is uh, basically a, a standalone application that you download from our website or from yep. SourceForge. Uh, and there's uh, there's installers for Windows and Linux and Mac, and uh, well, you run it as a process. So if you want to run this uh, from the cloud, I mean, what we've done is basically using Amazon uh, instances. Uh, mm -hmm. What's it going to be? Um, EC2, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, which gives you uh, a uh, Linux machine. So from that Linux machine, you remote to it, you install the agent. You, you set it up and then you can connect to it from the outside. So, yeah. I mean, there might be a bit more configuration uh, than you do on your regular mm -hmm. computer, but it's it's pretty easy to get. It, up it is story. really easy. Uh, and I mean, and talking about the Amazon, don't we have an AMI somewhere yeah. on the web yeah, that exactly. they can download? Is, uh, yeah, we have an yeah. AMI up, up on Amazon. And uh, I don't know if it's updated, it's but it should it's be. It's not updated for, for Load UI 2. Yeah. Yeah. So but it will be. Yeah. Yeah, but but it's uh, it's super easy, uh, and that was for Amazon. But I mean, that would go for Rackspace or whatever as well. So. Yeah. And then AMI, in Amazon terms, means that there's like an there's like an instance you yeah. can instantiate a machine like a, a template yeah. machine, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Amazon instance. Yeah. Amazon and how <laughs> how does like I mean, how does like LogiUI communicate with the agent? Do you need to open up firewalls and things? I mean, if you have it running in Amazon, or how does that work? Uh, you might. We use. Uh, you can change which port, but by default, we use uh, eight four four three. Okay. In fact, yeah. is it a, Do we have like? Is it our own protocol, or is it? What it's. Are we it's an. Uh, it's. It's over SSL. Um, okay. But it's basically our own. Uh, I mean, hmm. in on the top net. Of that. On top so of it's that, secured. So it's someone secured. else can't like hack in and start using your uh, Well, that's another thing. Uh, <laughs> by default, there's a key store that comes with Load UI that's mm -hmm. just configured to let itself in, basically. But mm -hmm. it, unless you, you change that yourself, then anyone, it's okay. unsecured. Yep. So so you can use you know standard Java tools to modify that key store, okay. and you can set up so that... And tweak it so it's super safe. So it's super safe, yeah. and exactly cool. those mm -hmm. clients you want to be able to yeah. connect things like that. And 8443, I think, uh, if you're using Amazon, you have to go into the... Unless you're using our AMI, if you're creating your own AMI, you have to uh, configure the firewall in the AMI yeah. mm -hmm. to open up 8444. Oh yeah. But it's super easy. Okay. Cool. We got another question here yep. uh, regarding Sophia from Derek1987. Yep. So he asked about the tab view mode in Sophia, how, how to enable the tab windows. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to ask because it was a boring answer. Sorry, uh, it's a pro feature. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, and if you're in pro, yeah. it's in the global preferences UI settings. So yep. if you're upgrading from standard to pro, then that uh, doesn't automatically switch to the tab view in all situations. Yep. So you might just have to go into the UI settings of the global preferences and select the tab mm -hmm. view. So. But it's good stuff. I, I, I love it. Um, so let's see. How do we set up agents in the cloud? Uh, JNK. Uh, that was the how do you run agents in the cloud? There was a, uh, let me just while you're yep. looking, there was a question a while ago, there was someone with the whistle where the default messages generated were, uh, I don't know, it was a couple of megabytes, so like the, the default project file just from importing whistle was 68 megs, yeah. which is maybe not the optimum size. So, I mean, what's probably happening there is that you have a lot of optional elements in your whistle, and by default, SOPUI generates uh, all, uh, like a sample message with all optional content. So there is, uh, once again, one of those low-level settings in the in the West global whistle settings where you can turn off the option to generate optional uh, mm -hmm. content, which usually really cuts down on the size of the uh, initial requests that SOPUI generates. Uh, yeah, and uh, some of that, if I can suggest, we, if we can suggest a demo link to test with SOPUI, Unfortunately, uh, the public web services, they go up and down. And mm. one we've been using for the longest time, mobile fish is gone, mm. the country thing. Uh, You're using this currency converter? Currency thing? converter. It's kind of crude. Uh, I personally, I mean, I use our old, you know, when you install SOPI, you get the sample project, uh, and that includes uh, a mock that you can use a lot. So I, I use that one a lot as well. Uh, should we look at the, we also, uh, wait, 
So look, look at what she does, and I'll go here and look at the, because some of you guys sent in a lot of questions uh, before the webinar. I think uh, we should look at yours as well. Mm -hmm. And Dennis, behind the camera, if you see any questions on Twitter, uh, shout them out so we can answer them. Um, so Sid has something. Yeah, he was there. having a problem with the sample project. Uh, it, it's hard to say from this. I mean, you should get back in. Um, you should uh, get back. Uh, you should get in touch with us so we can try to help you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's look at. The w we went through these. Uh, yeah, well, we got tons of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll be up here all night. Yeah. So. Okay, so th this is the, the uh, rapid fire question and answers that was kind of easy to answer, so I'll, I'll we'll just rush through them. Okay, uh, here's uh, two people asking how much it costs to upgrade uh, from an old version of SOPI Pro to a new version, and the answer is nothing. Because, I mean, you, I mean, you who are customers, you pay a yearly fee, 349 and we think in the yearly free, all upgrades should be <laughs> included, as well as support. So the it cost, uh, upgrade costs nothing, we want you to do it. Uh, here's uh, Stephen Price, uh, who's a dear friend. Uh, he's asking us a kind of a tougher question. What proactive steps are being done to address memory instability issues that seems to crop up in SOPI both 32 and 64 bit. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, proactive steps, not that many, yep. I would yep. say. I mean, the thing is that uh, the SOAP UI, when we generate, when we created initially, we had uh, uh, the idea of providing the user with as much information, so gathering yep. as much information as possible yep. about test results and assertions and messages being sent back and forth. And obviously, that's a model that's great if you're running you're getting started with the tool, small yep. tests, everything, you have everything available, you don't need to be like looking for stuff or afraid that you're going to lose it. But as you noticed, many of you, I think, uh, it doesn't scale to very large projects. And mm -hmm. I think what we need to do is, is basically uh, really go back to the design uh, board table and, and, yeah. and refactor how we're storing, the how we're persisting. Yeah test results and messages and things like that. Yeah. So that's that a big project. That's it's a big it's project. It's so I mean, we're very aware of it and mm -hmm. we, we have like technical ideas how to solve it, but there is unfortunately, there isn't any quick fix. Yeah. Of course, some of the memory issues you guys are experiencing are memory leaks, which are bugs. And those we, of course, try to minimize by doing yeah. memory profiling and things yeah. like that. But I think the, the core issue, if you run very data-driven tests with thousands and tens of thousands yeah. of rows, you're collecting a lot of results eventually it's just going to bump uh, yep. into the memory yep. that you have on your machine. And, and it is Java, so... Yeah, so is, we're aware of it, and uh, I think, as you say, it, it's something we will definitely yeah. try to, to yeah. handle in the future. Which also, Stephen Price uh, said that he thought that there are usability issues in, in SOPI, and uh, will you ever fix them? And the answer is yes. Uh, we actually, yeah, we know there are... Uh, things we would like, over time we've uh, realized isn't all that good and we would like to fix. And we have that as a possible actual release sometime in the future, just focusing on, on usability. And we have people like Henrik and Dane who really cares about it, which I think shows in Load UI. Uh, I can talk about that um, <laughs> trash can in Load UI for days. Uh, so I, I think we're learning as we go, and uh, yeah, we will do something about it. Uh, Neda, I think you're watching. Uh, I think that if I we didn't do anything about it, you would probably come and smack me in the face. Uh, also, a bit of constructive criticism is from Ahmed Khan, who's wondering uh, why did we add the, the last the release before four five was four zero and that was the security release mm -hmm. and he asked why are you doing it at all isn't that a development thing uh, why do you have it in the test tool uh, and it's a good point but I think first of all uh, so PI is used both by uh, testers and developers and second. 
I mean, what we've done is, and, and correct me here if I'm wrong, what we've tried to do is we've tried to create a, a small set of, of security tests which we call functional security. So there's no, uh, there's no network hacking, there's no uh, trying to attack the service. Basically, cause this is, these are the issues that tend to slip th through the development yeah. process anyway. That's what we were thinking. These are the ten most common uh, weaknesses in in uh, web services yeah. out there. Yeah, I mean, and also I think we we did actually do a user survey a couple yep. of years ago where security testing was the most the requested number one. feature. Yep. And yep. if you remember, last year we had the Sony PlayStation yep. Network and we had Facebook. We had a lot of sites having pretty, from a technical point of view, okay. simple security of, uh, uh, exploits with SQL injection, things like that. So. We found it pretty, uh, uh, like in yeah. easy conclusions there that we just like we have uh, make it easy to do uh, functional tests, uh, I think security is really something that's really important. Yes. And, uh, uh, and, and we want to make, make it easy for people just to do some baseline security tests. As you said, yep. we focused yep. on the, the, top, uh, the top vulnerabilities that were known and those that have also been exploited just to give the developers uh, just a tool at starting the security testing because, because most people don't even know where to start. And yeah, then exactly. Then and it seems so dan difficult and dangerous and hard and, and yeah. stuff, and it's not. Hmm. It's not. A lot of, I think a lot of testers should care and, and try out security testing. I mean, and we're not talking about heavy-duty pen testing here. We're talking about simple uh, security testing of, of uh, web services. Hmm. Uh, Kerry McCutcher asks if 4.5 is backward compatible with 4.0.1 and 3.6.1. The answer is yes. Next question. <laughs> uh, how, and this I don't understand this one actually. How do you handle REST APIs which are behind the firewall? Uh, if I understand you right, you're trying to uh, uh, get access to REST APIs which uh, you can't because there's a firewall be in between you and the and the REST API, which honestly the answer is you have to ask somebody to open up the firewall, mm. if I understand you correctly. So, uh, Simradi, if you're there, uh, please uh, expand on the question, because I might under understand it wrong. Uh, and here's one that we also have interpreted. Uh, it's by from Sanket how new tags can be imp implemented in the SOAPI request. Yeah. I think that's... I, I mean, I think we have several questions that seem to be like about the related to refactoring. Yeah, exactly. When a whistle changes, yeah. when the web service changes, how do we handle that in, in SOAPI? Yeah, and SOAPI yeah. Pro has a fantastically cool feature, <laughs> uh, which is the whistle refactoring, yeah. which basically, uh, if you've changed your whistle, you've changed the namespaces, added some new operations, renamed some elements, whatever, uh, if you, I mean, manually going through your project, updating all your requests, your XPath uh, expressions, everything is a mm -hmm. lot of work. So the Whistle refactoring basically just uh, looks at the old, the new and the old Whistle, and you graphically map the old uh, elements and the changes yep. to the new ones. And then SOPI Pro will do its best to, <laughs> in line with your mapping, yep. Yep. try to update all your requests and XPath stuff and all that kind yep. of thing. So there's that's a definite feature and uh, there in in the free version there's an uh, update uh, interface or yep. update different feature which is much more simpler and which basically just overwrites the existing with the yep. new one exactly. so those two are are, are s that that's really one of the reasons you would go for pro if you work like in an agile project where you're really refactoring and constantly adding new stuff yep. to your contracts yep. and that really makes sense and it, for you to work that way, yeah. it allows you to do that. Otherwise, you might be afraid of changing the whistle because it, it'll be a lot of work because you have to update your tests. But exactly. With this feature, you don't. Yeah. Also, there are two questions here that I, I would like to mention just to pimp our friends. Uh, and the uh, question one is we've gotten from, uh, for example, Ernestine Neely and Ulysse Odumosi. Uh, sorry if I <laughs> get that one wrong, but the question is, how do we integrate with H uh, QC, Quality Center? And the answer is, there's a great 
uh, tool out there from Agile Testware. Agile Testware, which actually integrates SOAP UI with uh, QC. It's 149 per year, I think, and it's fantastic. Check yep. Uh, also, somebody asks, uh, what about, do we do uh, SOAP UI courses and training? And we don't. But same thing there, you can actually contact, you know, Manny was in the chat room. You could t contact Manny because we have a friend uh, in Wise Clouds that does training for us. I mean, we're geeks. As you can see, we're not very, <laughs> we're not very good trainers. Uh, so we let that, leave that to people who knows how to handle it. But talk to Manny uh, or go to the Wise Clouds, their website. Uh, Okay, uh, if cloud tests can be geolocalized, uh, and I'm not quite sure because, but, but what we talked about is that, so we have this, uh, we, we, you will be able to run SOPI tests in the cloud uh, uh, in a month's time or so, uh, and there you can geolocalize them easily. Uh, does the multi-environment support involve the use of workspaces? The answer is no. Nope. And we don't think that's a super good idea. Uh, Bill Rabkin, you were, you were in there, right? Bill R? Yeah. Yep. Uh, SOAP UI Pro 4.5 for the Mac, when will the lack of find replace, pressing Command F, be fixed? So here's what we did, F3, for now. Uh, because the command F and all that stuff is actually more complicated than one would think. So that's a, a, a bigger issue. So for now, you can use F3 and it actually works. That's the nightly build, right? Or is it in the release? I think it was the nightly build. But I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe it is. You'll have to try. <laughs> if it isn't in the release, you go for the nightly build. Yeah. So there it is. But that's one of the things. We, we, we worked quite a lot on, on that stuff. But we have to do an overhaul of the entire shortcut mm -hmm. thing. Uh, let's, yeah, do you have? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are a lot of questions. One uh, recurring thing is about uh, integration with CVS. So, yes. I mean, uh, SOAP UI doesn't have any direct integrations with any source code management con control system. Uh, so, but what Sophia Pro does have is what we call composite projects, which is a really confusing term. So, but what it means basically that instead of saving your project in one project file, it splits the project into a bunch of smaller files. And you can then, using the command line or the tools of your source code management system, uh, uh, commit those files into the repository that you're using. And uh, of course, then just update and check out those uh, files that you work in, those test cases or test suites that you're going to work out in your team. So there's no direct integration. We would really love that, but it's just one of those things we're shying away from because there are so many uh, systems yeah, yeah, out there yeah, that we yeah. would need to support and keep an eye on on how they're being updated, yeah. etc. So, so we would su su S subversion CVS. Uh, Git, uh, Git, Mercurial, Perforce, ClearCase, clear case, clear case, Microsoft Teams yeah. Foundation. So there's a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah. uh, Which we, we would just be sitting updating uh, to support all these tools. We would like it though, still. I mean, something, when I'm, I'm uh, doing SOAP UI work, this is something I'm uh, mm. complaining about. Mm. Yeah. I would time. Yes. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I w no. was almost about to say yeah. something that rhymes with itching, but... Yeah. But so, but this is uh, using. Okay. There is a, a, a page on team testing on the website, and that does show talk a little about composite projects. So check that out, and uh, hopefully that I mean that works for you at least to get started with your team. Yeah, really asked here. I created one project in SOAP UI Pro. Is it possible to test the same project performance testing in Load UI? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's affirmative. Yep. That's the point, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of, th that's the entire point. D did you find any questions you thought were... Uh, uh, yeah, a few. Okay. Do you, want to start? Ha do you have any? Uh, let's see. Well, there was one quick one that we can easily answer uh, on Twitter. Uh, Hector Salazar asks, are features like data gen scripting and property transfer available for REST test cases in SOAP UI? And they are, there's no limitation. Yeah, I mean, there, that's right? the whole, yeah, you're totally right. So any, uh, I mean, the 
what we do with for REST requests and even HTTP and AMF and all those formats that in JDBC that we, yep. that we support is that we uh, internally we convert the responses to XML which means that you can use property transfers, you can use all the assertions, the nice message content assertion that Niklas showed earlier. Yep. You can use that to validate JDBC responses and anything and yep. you can of course use data gens to pull data into your uh, REST JSON uh, uh, post or put requests or yeah. whatever. So it, the, the j definitely you, c you can make uh, use of all those functional testing features for REST mm -hmm. and JDBC mm -hmm. and so on and everything. Yeah, but what you can't do, you can't mock REST services. You no, that's the yeah. limited thing, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I got two quick ones from uh, Ramesh on Twitter. Yep. So uh, can I set the session timeout? And I guess that's just for HTTP requests? And you can in global, in yeah. the Topia preference. Yeah. So the, s the session timeout or the request timeout? Is yeah, it it's a good point, but. A session timeout? The only thing I can think of is the. Like it's gotta be the, the, the request timeout. Yeah. No, cause Cause the, re you, the request timeout you can set. I don't know. I mean, Why would you like to set a, a session timeout? I don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, if you want to simulate. Uh, um, I don't know how. That's why on the server side, I guess. Yeah, that's on the server side, you're right. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, you need maybe give us some details on that. Yeah. If, you, if you don't mean request timeout. Yeah, because the session is, is set from the servers. That yeah, that sounds is like a server TKL thing. TKL is if something, it's like yeah. a, if, if that propagates into a cookie, uh, then the cookie will expire, and, yeah. and SOPI yeah. will honor that. So yeah. Yeah. And then there's another question from Ramesh. Uh, SOPI is open source, question mark. Can I use it for commercial? And you can. Yes. 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 That's what we do, actually. <laughs> 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 no, but of course you can. That, uh, w we don't care, I uh, mm. uh, almost said. Uh, Definitely. So, yeah. But use, it, use Pro because it's, it's quicker. Mm. But of course. Uh, I think I saw something in here, too. I think uh -huh. it was a bit Something that was up. interesting? Because now we're know. in uh, the... The general questions. Oh, I think it was the last one you were looking at. Uh huh. Uh, this one. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, Carrie McCutcheon there asked um, using LoadUI to test uh, a web page, uh -huh. uh, specifically integrating the output of one web page and direct, or interpreting the output of one web page and directing to another page. So, if I understand that correctly, basically first doing a request, checking something uh, with the response of that. And then, depending on if that's valid or not, direct to another page. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do have, uh, I mean, you can do this, you can obviously do this in SOAP UI and uh, use a SOAP UI runner, but we also have this uh, condition component in Load UI. So, uh, and that's scriptable with Groovy. So you mm -hmm. can, you can, you know, parse out whatever you want from the response and, and um, interpret that and then split mm -hmm. uh, to go, you know, left or right, depending on the outcome of that. Mm -hmm. Tushar asked whether or not we plan to have an R&D facility in India. Uh, and the honest answer is, uh, I think some of us would like to move to India. Uh, For the weather, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, the yeah. Food. and the food. Mm. Uh, but uh, no uh, immediate plans, of mm. course. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a nice thought. But I only will do it if I can move there. Okay. Yeah, I can take another one here. So Shaikh is asking how to validate each value while doing data-driven testing using Excel and SOAP UI. And the reason I'm going to answer this is because there's a there's a really good tutorial on, on specifically how to do this on our website. Yeah. So if you go to SOAP UI org data-driven testing functional, there is a, a tutorial and there's even a video uh, showing you how to use an Excel sheet to do a data-driven test where the, the Excel sheet both contains the input data and the expected values which are then used in an assertion. So check that out, that, that should help you forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should we answer this one? Uh, sure. How data source is shared between running threads during load test? Oh yeah, good question. And uh, how they're shared? I mean, if, if you... Yeah, this... In the uh, data source, is if you click settings, you can mm -hmm. set it to shared, right? Yeah, exactly. So by so the, the exactly, you can configure the data source to be shared between the running threads. By default, it isn't. So by default, yep. each thread gets its own data source, yep. yeah. uh, which you might or might not want. Usually, you don't. Uh, usually, you want to share. 
the pool of data between the threads. But uh, if you uncheck that, uh, or if you check that shared data source, then mm -hmm. it will be shared between threads. So that's, that's a soup UI setting. Yeah, that's a soup UI yeah. uh, and setting. It will setting. Yeah, and it will, I mean, propagate or it will affect the test in low yeah, if you're using yeah. if you're using that as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. It, I think it, it works similar. It will propagate just the same. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we've been going on for one and a half hour. Should we wrap up with uh, a few questions? Uh, like I said, uh, we will be, let's make a promise. Uh, I will be on, or we will be on, on uh, Twitter for two more hours afterwards. Uh, did we have something interesting here in the, if you, if you, Oh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, yeah. things here. So Rayesh is asking how to pass objects from one groovy step to another one. Uh, so in, in the groovy steps, you have access to the context object, which we context object, which is basically a, a just a, a string to object map. So you can just store it, store it there, and then uh, using some key context dot my object equals the object, and then in the f uh, groovy in the next step, you can just retrieve it from that. Of course, that will only work when you're running the actual test case, since yeah. uh, if you just run the scripts one by one, uh, there is no con there is no context being propagated. So be sure when you test that, try that so out. You have to run the test case. I would use, I probably still would use properties. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it d depends I on if, yeah, if you yeah. have a, compl a Java object that you want to Oh yeah, I, oh then if it's then th that it's complex, yeah. absolutely. But if it's just, if it's if it's just, just values, then definitely yeah. uh, using property transfers. Because you, then you could use those uh, from uh, from, uh, and we didn't show that from uh, debugging as well. Mm. So if you have properties, you could actually see how the values changes. Mm. Properties. Yeah. So, but that's a, it's a matter of taste. Yes. Oh, and we got some inline coding here. <laughs> yeah. From Henry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. <laughs> okay. So, is it possible to generate reports like SOPI Pro and SOPI? Uh, no. No. <laughs> you have simple <laughs> answer. <laughs> That's why you got to go pro. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. No, it's too hard. And uh, it's uh, one of those things that makes it worth it. Uh, I would like to see. Oh. This is something we got both in, uh, sorry, it was good that I saw this. Simon uh, Rebstock and somebody in the chat room mm -hmm. earlier asked about Kerberos. Mm -hmm. And I think we should mention that as well. Yeah, so there is uh, some Kerberos support in uh, the new SOPI 4.5. Uh, I'm not a Kerberos expert myself, so I can't really say how much of that standard we do support. Mm -hmm. So I think you should get in, t I mean, get in touch with us and we can point you at the, the, the documentation where it does say uh, how to configure Kerberos with SOAP UI and, and just as well as we added support for NTLM version 2 which is used by many Microsoft uh, proxies and yeah, tool grid web so IIS and things like that so it's it's I don't think it supports everything you can do in Kerberos but it does have some yeah. support yeah and uh, I saw Eric Eveling in the chat room earlier and okay. uh, he's he I think he's he built the Kerberos yeah, support. He knows about in, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One question I, I just remember is someone asking if you can now run multiple projects with the Maven plugin for SOAP UI. And unfortunately, the answer to that is still no. It's one of those features we just didn't have mm -hmm. time to fix. So, uh, but it is high on our list. So, yeah, it will be there eventually. Yeah. Also, uh, far up. Uh, asked about Team Foundation Server, uh, whether or not there is a way to transfer test cases from SOPI to TFS. Uh, I, we don't know of one. No, Honestly. I mean, there's no plugin <coughs> like no the exactly. Agile test yeah. plugin for QC. So, um, unfortunately, well, the question for that is no. Not that we know. <laughs> not that we know. Um, and I'm thinking here, should we uh, talk a bit about what we plan to do, wrap up by saying what we plan to do with SOAP UI and Load UI, since we release 4 or 5 now, mm -hmm. talk about a bit what we, where our plans are for the next release. This was <laughs> unplanned. But mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, yeah sure. We can uh, when we were talking about TFS, I, I was thinking Microsoft, and then I was yeah. thinking uh, WCF. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the big uh, 
uh, features we're lacking is good support for WCF mm -hmm. and those related standards. Yep. And we have a lot. Of I mean, people doing using the using .NET technologies and having to resort to the basic HTTP, HTTP binding to yep. be able to test uh, with SOAP UI. And I think that's one of the main things we want to address in the next version to make it easy to test uh, WS HTTP binding services and uh, related service standards in the .NET uh, WCF uh, world. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really high on our list uh, to to improve support for Microsoft uh, platforms. Yeah, for software. absolutely. Yeah, and we're currently looking at which bindings we think uh, we should support. Uh, so, if you're Microsoft people, uh, get in contact with us because this is where you can really uh, affect uh, SOAP UI 5. If you tell us this uh, binding needs to be supported, and enough of you say so, uh, it will go into we'll SOAP UI 5. It. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, and load UI, w we're doing a, a kind of a short release this time. Uh, it's not going to be as big as, and we're basically going to look at uh, what people think is important. So this is a, it's the same thing. This is, next release of load UI is going to be basically a community release. Yep. Small stuff that you think is important. And I don't remember, I couldn't find that. Somebody asked in the questions beforehand, why we uh, why we ha are only in Java FX one three and not two, and that's what we're going to do after the uh, yeah. the, the 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 point release or whatever we say. Mm. Yeah. So okay. I mean, this is pretty technical, but uh, load UI to do the user interface. We're using Java FX and we're using Java FX one dot three, uh, and there's a Java FX two dot zero that's mm. out right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But these two um, versions are very different uh, technology-wise. They use completely different language. So mm -hmm. uh, basically, we're going to have to do quite a lot of work to rewrite our user interface using JawFX 2 instead. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a bit time-consuming, and we didn't want to start that too early because JawFX 2 had just been released, and it's kind of in development preview mode. Mm -hmm. So we wanted, that, we wanted to give that opportunity to basically mature a bit before jumping ship to that. Yeah. But we are going to uh, move to that in the future. Yeah. yeah. And we had some good questions here. Uh, I think this one is uh, good because it's a hard question. How do you ca characterize the maturity of load UI relative to SOAP UI? I think that I love those kind of questions because it's <laughs> really hard to answer. Uh, so load UI is hmm. being uh, out for one and a half year, mm -hmm. is it? Yeah. And so then we had like two years of development before that. So yeah. It's and Sopia has been out for what seven, six and a half years. Yeah. yeah. And maybe of course, Sopia is more mature. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I do think that. I think I you could say maybe feature-wise that Sopia is more mature. That yeah. we've added a lot of features that people have been asking for for the years. Yeah. But maybe technology-wise, uh, I mean, and stabil I'm thinking stability stability wise, stuff like that. Yeah. I think we've been learning a lot from our mistakes, yeah. and, and uh, also making a huge effort when it comes to usability and yeah. UI, yeah. Uh, which is lacking in SOAP UI, uh, yeah. definitely. I think so. That there, there, I think we've been better at load UI currently. So I think it's a uh, there are pros and cons. Exactly. So I think the point that um, I th what I would like to say, I think. Uh, Load UI is really mature mm. in terms of, of uh, quality and so on. Mm. But uh, yeah, what do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> Be honest. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. I think it's it's uh, good, and, and of course we're striving. It's always going to be getting better, uh, and there's always, of course, going to be bugs. But you know, yeah, sure. Yeah, we're always moving forward. Yeah, and why we don't why we don't because you can use JavaScript yeah there's so a question about documentation <coughs> on uh, Groovy but why not for JavaScript so there is JavaScript support in, in SOAP UI it's, it's a bit limited so you don't you can't do like script libraries with JavaScript yeah. and uh, things like that and I think the reason we haven't documented it that well is probably because we've been sloppy documenting <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we, we need to improve that documentation yeah, yeah. but I th we, we know that most of our Users are using Groovy for the script thing, but the, it's a good point, and we should definitely improve it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also one question. Two two people in the chat asking about 
how to perform data-driven tests using GroovyScript for RESTful services. And uh, myself, would, I, I would wouldn't. Uh, I mean, you can ask in the forum there. I've seen some people taking a shot at it, but I wouldn't do it myself. I would use Pro, to be honest, because it's data sources are more complex than you think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there's there's this thing we've talked about before, sharing. Mm -hmm. yep. Then you need so then you need synchronization. You need to know about the uh, concurrent programming. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so it's not very easy to do. And and I mean, Sophia Pro data sources they work for REST as well as for XML and for I mean yep. there's no difference. No. <coughs> yeah. So basically, <coughs> you will be sitting down writing Groovy scripts for. 80 hours to save 340 bucks. And then when 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 something is not working as as you think as you expect it to, yeah. which it always is. I mean, yeah. when you're developing test cases, it's always like then you you won't be able to like trust the software. You mm -hmm. you won't be able to see to to know that this data source is tested yeah. by millions of people. So so I I wouldn't think it's worth it. Yeah. But, but he's saying that th this is fine because we do also have a tutorial on sopia.org how you uh, create da data driven tests with Groovy. Mm -hmm. And he's saying he could get it done for SOAP, well, for SOAP services but not for REST. It's hard to say. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, you'll mm -hmm. have to get in touch and show us what you've done and we can say yeah. why. But there's no. Yeah, it's hard to say from this what the issue uh -huh. could be. It should work. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, just so we can upload the video to uh, YouTube, uh, we've been going on for one hour forty-five now. One hour forty. I think we should wrap up. Uh, last time we did this, uh, we said let's meet again in six weeks. That was six months ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll try to behave because uh, the problem is wh when we talk this seldom I think uh, there's so many questions and we just don't have time to answer them all which is it's kind of sad mm. um, yeah so we'll talk again in six days but we'll try to behave and we'll try to uh, do uh, a new webinar uh, sooner soon. yeah uh, but we will also be available on, on Twitter uh, pretty soon. Uh, yeah. Like after this meeting. After, after this, this meeting and, and uh, two hours going forward. Uh, what else? Follow us on Twitter. We'll talk there now. Uh, Ulla will do, be doing the webinar on, on uh, yeah, 15 cloud uh, API, on, on, yeah, API yeah. monitoring mm -hmm. in the cloud. Uh, which also will be a, a fantastic new feature, so take a look at that. Uh, oh, uh, and, and also thank you for all the questions. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Thanks for your love. Yeah. Love uh, you. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and uh, so we'll turn off the camera. Uh, we will be uh, talking to you online. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.